Stay tuned. Coming up is our interview with Vince Mulray, retired Philadelphia Fire Department Deputy Fire Chief, discussing the 2015 derailment of Amtrak train 188 traveling from Washington, D.C. to New York City. Hello and welcome to the Situational Awareness Matters show, episode 399. I'm your host, Rich Gassaway. The purpose of this show is to improve situational awareness and decision-making for individuals and teams who work in high-risk, high-consequence, time-compressed environments with changing conditions. The SA Matters mission is simple. We want to help you see the bad things coming and time to prevent bad outcomes. Today's feature segment is sponsored by Gasaway Virtual Training. There are 33 online training programs there for you to choose from. Some of the programs are live events presented virtually, and some of them are pre-recorded programs. To learn more, visit the essaymatters.com website and click on the Virtual Training tab. All right, <clears throat> let's jump into our feature segment, our interview, with Vince Mulray, retired Philadelphia Deputy Fire Chief, discussing the 2015 derailment of Amtrak train 188 traveling from Washington, D.C. to New York City. Hey everyone, Rich Gasway here, host of the Situational Awareness Matters show. And today I have with me Vince Mulray, uh, retired from the Philadelphia Fire Department, and we're going to talk about an Amtrak train derailment that they had in Philadelphia. So let me give you a little bit of the backstory about this, and then we'll bring Vince in to the show. On May 12, 2015, at approximately 9.20 p.m., Amtrak train 188, traveling from Washington, D.C. to New York City, derailed and crashed on the Frankfurt Junction curve on Amtrak's North Corridor. The incident required the rescue, extrication, treatment, and transportation of over 200 passengers. The train derailment and crash involved seven passenger cars and one electric engine on Amtrak's North Corridor at the Frankfurt Junction Curve. Amtrak estimated that this accident would cost taxpayers approximately $9.2 million. Initial Responding companies remained on the scene for one complete operational period. Fire department assistance was required from, for approximately five days until the service was fully restored. One accomplishment was, should be noted, that there were no fire department injuries uh, reported in the response. Frankfurt Junction is the former railroad station with, with an active rail yard approximately three miles from Antrax's North Philadelphia Station. Amtrak's North Corridor Line travels from this area on four tracks that form an S-curve with a 50 mile an hour speed limit for all trains. The slowest track speed limit between Washington DC and New York City, the train's final destination. The junction was well known for first responders and local residents because of previous accident that occurred on September 6th 1943, the Congressional Limited Travel no, Traveling uh, Nonstop from Washington, D oh, I see the train was Congressional Limited, traveling nonstop from Washington, D.C. to New York City, derailed on the same general area. On that time, it killed 79 people of, of the 541 passengers aboard. Amtrak train records indicated that on train 188, a, an emergency application of its brakes occurred approximately 920. The fire department's 911 call center received its first notification at 927 and dispatched a full box assignment of four engines, two ladders, two battalion chiefs, and two medic units at 928 for a derailed train, which would be elevated to a four alarm response before being placed under control. Approximately 180 firefighters, emergency medical technicians, and paramedics were summoned. Philadelphia Police Department sent approximately 200 work working district officers who provided scene control and acted as stretcher barriers. Now, just a note for the uh, listeners and viewers here, 
This is our second episode highlighting lessons learned from an Amtrak train derailment. In episode number 192, I interviewed Fire Chief Larry Creekmore uh, about a train derailment, an Amtrak train derailment that occurred in Washington State. Uh, and that happened, ironically, one day prior to me going to Washington State to conduct situational awareness training programs. So while I was there, I sat down with Chief Creekmore and interviewed him about the fire department's multiple fire department's involvement in that derailment. So if you want to hear that one uh, as well, you can go back and listen to episode 192. Welcome, Vince. Glad to have you on the show. Thanks for having me, Rich. Yeah. So let's start with... Uh, Telling us a little bit about the Philadelphia Fire Department and the trajectory of your career up through the fire department. All right. Um, right now in 2023, the fire department has a budgeted um, for about 20 th or 3,000 fire firemen and paramedics. The city is broken into three divisions, which when I, before I retired, I was uh, a division chief. I handled one division. We also have 13 battalions, 61 engines, 27 ladders, two, uh, three special operations companies, which one of them is uh, heavy rescue. We have a hazmat unit, two fire boats, uh, and a host of other things. Um, my career started in 1988. I uh, was appointed as a fireman. I spent four years as a fireman working in lower North Philadelphia. I spent seven years as a lieutenant, eight years as a captain, nine years as a battalion chief. And that's what at the time span where this uh, train derailment is going to come in. Um, and then I ended my career career for the last seven as a deputy chief with five being in division two, which would have been the area for this. While I was progressing through the ranks, I also um embrace the educational process so while i was a lieutenant i went to community college when i was a captain i went to holy family for a, a bachelor's in fire administration i finished up with uh, a master's degree in public safety from saint joe's and i also went to the national fire academy for the efo program where i first met you rich probably a decade or so ago so while I'm going through my experience, my education, and my and certifications, which I also embraced, every research paper that I did uh, up to in the educational process, I did on some kind of railroad accident. So my thesis for St. Joe's was, um, you know, um, let me see. It was a hazard analysis for a potential train incident in Center City, Philadelphia. Uh, when I went to the National Ca uh, Fire Academy, my capstone class for that was a hazard analysis and vulnerability assessment for the, the Philadelphia Center City Rail Tunnel. Most of, my, most of my interest in this came from my experience before I got on the fire department. I spent approximately four years as a SEPTA train engineer. So I was kind of a fire buff and a train buff at the same time. And that kept me aware of my surroundings everywhere I went. I would frequently visit this rail yard because um, during that time period when I was at Battalion 10, which was the unit that responded here, I had several different field in incident technicians. And I would always make them aware of the physical characteristics of the railroad. The railroad in several forms cut all through our first in local, and uh, there was a lot of hazards associated with it. Most of it was um, um, freight rail. But as you see, you know, this one happened to be a passenger train. We've had several incidents over the three and a half years that I was at Battalion 10, but nothing to this extent. You know, we, we would have a derailment, uh, you know, a, a train came off the tracks. It would be a train going 10 or 15 miles an hour who, you know, a rail broke and the train was off the track. It was a minor incident almost every time we've had one. Uh, you know, these these incidents are few and far between. So that's a little bit about my department, a little bit about the experience and uh, how I prepared for this particular incident. It was a lot of luck. You know, every uh, municipality, whether it was at the city the state or the federal level contributed to my education and to the experience that I had that I needed that particular night. Um, so you have, so I think maybe one of the best ways to kind of set this whole thing up is 
you have two video clips. One that was shot during the daytime that <clears throat> you went, rode the train, and basically shot the route, a video of the route that the, 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 the derailed train was traveling on. And you have some notable things that we're going to be able to see, but only because it's daylight. And then you have a yes. second video of the actual derailment of the train traveling at night um, that we're not going to be able to see as much as what you're going to show and point out during the day. But I think it sets the framework for what we would see in the nighttime video of the actual train derailment. So maybe we could bring up first the daylight video, show it, you could narrate that, then the nighttime video, and then we can jump back into the incident because it'll give some context for the uh, for folks as to what you know what this uh, geography looked like. All right, Rich, can you hear me? Yep. Okay, so this is this is starting the video, and we're on our way to Frankfurt Junction. Um, we're going on track number one, which we are on a, actually a SEPTA train. And I wasn't able to get right up to the window, but this is as close as they would let me get and still video. And I had to let the uh, person who was sitting in the seat in front of me know that I was shooting a video, and I would just appreciate it if she continued to let me do it. The first bridge that we're coming up to is the G Street Bridge. And it's just a location in the neighborhood that, you know, we would know if we had an incident around here. The railroad uses stations as identifiers for what particular part you are on the railroad. The first indication we see is this yellow 50 sign. And this is telling the, the train operator, or it's a speed restriction. The train operator, there's a speed restriction in this area. If you look up here where the cursor is, it's a 50 mile an hour sign. That's the only indication on track number two that there's a slow curve coming up. The train that's just going to cross us is the Market Frankfurt L. And this is another rail line, but it's a light rail. It's not the same as the regional rail or the Amtrak service that we're on. The track that we're on is Amtrak's Northeast Corridor. To our right is an unwired freight track, and it, I believe they call that the O track. We're on track number one, number two to our left, number three, and number four. We're coming up to a uh, an old uh, tower here, and it's called Shure Tower. Now, Amtrak has taken everybody out of these towers, and they run this now from Wilmington, Delaware. That, con that tower would have controlled all those tracks. And when you look at the tracks that go off to the right, we're either going to go into Frankfurt Junction Yard or we're going to go across uh, the Del Air Bridge to New Jersey. The only way to get to um, New Jersey by rail. We're coming up and now right in front of us, you see some rail cars and some tankers and they're in the Frankfurt Junction Yard. This metal building here is it's a signal building that controls all these signals. Uh, when you look at how clean this is on the right, that's the former crash scene that they cleaned up. Some of these catenary poles have been replaced. That catenary pole with the uh, concrete encasement around it, uh, Amtrak did that to preserve it after the crash. Above us was a pedestrian bridge that we'll talk a little bit about later in the presentation. Here we have another similar Amtrak train coming towards us. Uh, it had, I think it has eight cars. The Amtrak 188 has seven cars. Once you come out of this uh, train, this uh, right-hand curve, the track speed increases considerably. And this is where the Amtrak engineer thought he was. He thought he was well beyond this, where his track speeds increase greatly. That pretty much covers that video. Did I miss anything, Rich? Nope. So when it, when it was... Uh, it's important to, when it started to make that curve to the left where you saw that uh, that concrete enclosed vertical stanchion there is where the train actually derailed. So let's let's show the the nighttime uh, video of the actual derailment itself. I know there won't be a, it's a little bit shorter and so there, and it's nighttime, so there won't be as much to narrate, but we can at least see what was actually occurring on the the time of the derailment. All right, so 
that bridge that you see up here is the Market Frankfurt L again. So that is really uh, one of the um, physical characteristics that would tip off the engineer that he was coming up to this 50 mile an hour curve, along with that one small 50 sign that was hanging from the catenary. Once I hit this, it's going to go pretty quick. We're going to go right by um, the Market Frankfurt line. We're going to go by Shore Tower. We're going to go by the tracks that go off to the right. You're going to see the little signal box, the little house, and then the train's going to come off the tracks. This is Amtrak's 188 forward-facing camera. This this particular visit uh, video was provided by the NTSB. It was part of their investigation. And as you know, they do probably one of the most thorough investigations of any accident or incident, you know, that I know of. So yeah, this is a video. The, before you hit the play button, the, the daytime video, how fast was the train going in the daytime video? In, in the daytime video, the, the train was going to, uh, uh, no faster than 30 miles an hour. Okay, and here in the nighttime video? Um, we know he throttled up at some point to 106 miles an hour. And then he made an emergency application of the brakes, and we think the train came down to about 103 miles an hour. So well, he hit up, this it curve. It came off the rails at 103 miles an hour. More or less, yes. Okay. Uh, there was some speculation that if he could have got it down to 80 miles an hour, he might have made it around the curve. But I don't, I don't know about that. There's a lot of you know a lot of stuff like that out on the railroad. All right, I'm going to hit play, and it's going to be very fast. I don't know if I'll be able to talk through it. We're probably 100 miles an hour. There's the tracks going off to the right. You're going to see uh, that silver building on the right briefly, and somewhere in here he realizes that he's not where he thought he was. And we're on track number two. We're going too fast. The emergency application also, you know, may have had some bearing on this train going off the track. If if it was a if it was a full brake application without dumping the train, so to speak, it, it, the train might have handled a little bit different. Again, there's things that you ju we just don't know. Mm. But the train ends up in the Frankfurt Junction yard on its side, and uh, as you know, I have a couple more photos um, to explain that a little bit better. It's it, for the viewers, it's going to be easier to 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 yeah, uh, if you if you want to bring bring up some of them photos now, you know it it uh, it helps to be able to get the get our minds wrapped around what's going on here to see, especially like the photos that show like the the layout of the train derailment and such. So I, I only put this one on because it just shows the uh, uh, proximity to Center City, Philadelphia. You can see Center City, Philadelphia is about eight miles away. The train actually comes on an arc all the way through lower North Philadelphia, comes around and curves up to this Frankfurt Junction area. This particular rail yard is one of the oldest uh, rail yards in the city. It was established somewhere in the 1830s, and it was a very short line that went from Frankfurt Junction, I believe, to Morrisville, PA, uh, right outside of Trenton. And then over the years, through the 1860s, the railroad really took off. And all of this was connected where it, it eventually became part of the uh, the Pennsylvania Railroads line and then the Amtrak's Northeast Corridor. And that's, well, you know, one of the busiest uh, rail lines uh, probably in the nation. So we're, now we're looking, we're on the north side, we're looking south. You can see at the bottom of the screen, you can see the engine 601 is there and it's kind of by itself. Then we have a pedestrian bridge. This bridge was, uh, it's condemned. Amtrak, uh, Amtrak and SEPTA didn't really want us to, to use it, and we never did take advantage of that uh, because of the condition that it was in. It was used to take uh, people from the neighborhood, which Bridesburg was to the left, to connect the two neighborhoods together. And I don't know, it's, it hasn't worked in, in years. But you can see there's debris right in the middle. And this particular photo was taken the day after because um, there's a crane here and they're working on uh, car number one. So then you got two, three, and four, which are on their side. Number five is predict perpendicular to the track. And then six and seven are derailed, but they're upright. So this area right here is what we're going to call um, the East Division. And this is where I responded from. That little red car would have been my car. 
And we, we all knew this area because of the railroad, and we knew it because of two addresses. On this side of the tracks, there's a factory, and it used to be called, the, it was a felt factory. And over the years, almost every fireman that worked in this neighborhood had a fire in the felt factory. And it was 2121 Wheat Chief Lane. This side of the track is 2095 Wheat Chief Lane. And obviously, it's not connected through here. So you have to go around this whole rail yard, get to 2121. It was one of the things that made this, uh, you know, pretty well known. I mean, I was only here for three years and I knew it pretty well. And because over the years when I worked in this neighborhood, I made fires in the felt factory. You know what I mean? So it was one of those things that everybody knew, all the firemen knew. This, this line here is what goes over to New Jersey. And they still use this part of the rail line. In the 50s, this, there would have been tracks on every square foot of this rail yard. But now they, they call this the Frankfurt Yard Track. It's about a mile or two. It goes down into the neighborhood, and mostly it's used just for storage. At one point, it would have it went a little bit further to another rail yard that was closer to the city. So even though we're calling this the uh, east side, we made the end of this building down in here, this area here, the west side. We kind of tried to break this into two pieces uh, because when I arrived, I was a battalion chief. I took one end. There was two battalion chiefs responding. I gave the other battalion chief the other side. I maintained command, and I also um, took care of my division, so to speak. Um, the article that I wrote for Fire Engineering Magazine was uh, Amtrak the Railman Operations, the first 24 minutes. I was in command for the first 24 minutes until Division 2 showed up, the deputy chief for this particular area, and he assumes command. So this is just a general layout. Um, the only other thing you could see is there was a street on the southern end, and that's where the office was for this giant rail yard. This 2121, which I tried to use, 2121 Wheat Chief Lane, this area, this was not accessible during the initial... Uh, two hours of the in incident because these uh, steward rail cars all blocked that access to that area. So that that's basically it for this. I want to go. I want to flip it to another photo. The reason I put this photo up is because now we're on the south side looking north, and the NTSB used this for their investigation, and they call these tracks in the ground witness tracks. And I found that very interesting. So you can see car number one totally demolished. Two, three, four, five is perpendicular to the track. Six and seven are derailed. Right in here, there is a missing uh, catenary pole. That catenary pole was physically ripped out of the ground. The next catenary pole here, this is the one that's encased in concrete. That was damaged, but it must have been okay enough where they thought that if they put three or four feet of concrete around it, they could still use it. So one of these cars has to hit this catenary pole. One of these cars, obviously, or several cars, hit this one. But the the lead engine is way up here, and it's almost unscathed. It's, it's damaged, but it's not damaged anywhere near any of these other cars are. It threaded the needle through this rail line and through all those other catenary poles and came to rest within feet of some steward uh, tanker cars. So car number one, which was a business class car, it took the major brunt by hitting one of these catenary poles. And I'm not sure if it hit the one that's totally ripped out or the second one or both. So this is ma the main reason I put this on. This would be, again, the um, East Division, and the other side of the building, which was several hundred feet away, became the West Division. We wound up splitting this up into two. Another reason we split this scene into two like that, it was because of the way the people evacuated. Once we came through this gate and opened the gate and had our flashlights on, the, the people evacuating, the, self, the walking wounded, they walked towards the light. We're talking about this area now is pitch black. So we had probably somewhere between 50 and 100 people come up this way that needed to be uh, triaged, treated, and uh, transported. And we also had an equal amount on the other end. 
one of my challenges on this particular assignment was trying to do a 360. I got up to the top here and I walked in and I'm walking across and I want to make a right hand turn because I know that the majority of the incident is to my right. But I can't do it because of the down catenary wires and the down catenary poles. And some of these wires are 138,000 volts. Some of them are more. The railroad controls all the wires on the low end, they, the catenary and the transmission lines. But the very top wires are all controlled by Philadelphia Electric. And it's just something that you know we have no control over. They will not um, tell you the wires are de-energized until they physically send a uh, Class A mechanic there to check that the wires are de-energized. So I was never able to do a 360. I had to use radio reports in order to get a handle on it. But when I look down the track in would either call a, um, a westerly direction or a uh, southern direction, I could see in the light the silhouettes of people walking and self-evacuating into that area. Also, during the same time, we had about 30 people walk through the rail yard and walk to the office of uh, the Frankfurt Junction Yard. So there was, there was a lot going on at one time, and a lot of it was dictated by uh, the human factors and how people self-evacuated, people who could. And again, I just, I'm going to. This is a little redundant. This, you see the direction of the train. You see Wee Chi Flain, um, car number one, almost recognizable. Car two, three, and four on their side. Car four was the club car, five perpendicular to the track, but upright. Six and seven, they were just derailed. And again, this is a an, another depiction. It, it shows you. Uh, where the initial command post was. We had rehab, our mobile EOC, which had the uh, executive leadership in, the mayor, uh, the Office of Emergency Management, our, some of our commissioners, East Division EMS. This was where the first um, paramedic squad responded and became triage. Um, the person who we had in that position, I believe she triaged 50 or 60 different people and tagged them. But everything we did on the East Division, we also had to replicate on the West Division. And even for a department of my size that has, you know, 60 medic units and an EMS command structure and uh, pretty much almost unlimited resources, this taxed our system, having two separate of everything. And, you know, you got to realize that's what's going to happen when you have an incident like this that, you know, geographically is spread apart. Um Trying to think, there's anything else. Most, how did, of, most how did, of the, go ahead. How did the call come in? What did what? How were you dispatched? What was said over the radio? So we got dispatched to 2095 for a. Um, I'm not sure if it was a, a train crash or, or or a train incident. And I happened to ask en route uh, if they had any additional information. And I do that once in a while, but it's not a, a, something I do every time. And they told me it was a passenger train. So that kind of really set the stage a little bit because, like I said, we've had a few minor incidents over the years, but they've all been uh, freight cars. And it's all been, you know, minor derailment, broken rail, something small, small fire. Um, but when they said it was a passenger train, it kind of set the stakes a little higher. And when I arrived on the scene, we, we were actually, we, I arrived from about a mile away. So my driver, goes down Castor Avenue, makes a left-hand turn on Frankfurt. So we get to Frankfurt and Sedgley. And I remember looking across this field because we, we weren't really sure where it was. And I didn't see anything that indicated a train crash or any people in this area. So then we go down to the two more blocks to Wee Chief Lane. We make a right and we go down to the end of the tracks. And the, the people who, the firemen who work in this area knew it very well. My, my driver knew it well. So we get there and there's a police sergeant and he said, we need bolt cutters. There's a train that is rolled over. So we get to the end, this gate here, we cut the lock. And uh, that was last I seen my, of my counterpart, the, the sergeant. Uh, I request a second alarm with five additional medic units. And I make the um, staging area, Frankfurt and Wee Chief, about, about two, two blocks away. 
And I direct all my companies to uh, keep the main street open for medic units because we knew we were going to need them. So my counterpart in the police department, his report was send me everything you have. Send me everything you got. <laughs> so that brought a that brought almost every police officer in Northeast Philadelphia and some a little further to the scene. And it was a, uh, I always say it was a blessing and a curse. It was a blessing because we had plenty of people to carry people, stretcher bears, you know what I mean? It, the latter part of that, we set up the scene control. That took a little bit, of, a little while. But they were a curse because each one of them came in a, in a squad car and they all they normally work alone. So they come up to a scene, they park in the middle of the street, they lock their car and then it's an immovable object. And it created um, this is not a big area to begin with. The streets are, you know, 24, 30 feet wide, parking on both sides. We chief lane for that particular night was a blank canvas for us. Uh, it's an industrial area. At night, it's very desolate, and there was no other cars parked there. There was nobody else on in this area. It was uh, that helped us a lot. Uh, one of the things, the first in engine company, I responded from Kensington and Castor. It was engine seven. The pump operator goes down, and they uh, they swing a U turn, and they take the hydrant, which is right here on the left. I might have a photo of it coming up, and. Um, No, I got to try to go back, Rich. Okay. So the, they, they swing a U-turn, face the rear end towards the incident, and take the hydrant, which was right here. They stretch a three-inch water line, which happens to be yellow for our department, and they stretch it to the scene, and they drop their bag in case there was a fire, because there were some reports that there was a fire. We have never were able to substantiate that. Uh, but that three-inch water line created a guide path to safety so anybody walking wounded if they didn't know where to go if they couldn't see the light we told them follow the water line because it went right to this area right in here and that was where our triage area was you know one of the differences between this particular assignment and a lot of other ones we had we could not operate we could not care for patients in this area because it was untenable there was debris everywhere. It was dirty. It was dusty. It was dark. Uh, we had to move the people into a cleaner area in order to be able to, you know, treat them properly. And uh, that's what these two areas was: the West Division and the East Division. It, we had to get them off the scene. It was just uh, you, you couldn't operate down in here. Um, I'm going to presume that you stayed fixed at the command post and some oh no. it's it's interesting you say that so when i first arrived i'm at the top of the track here on track number one and i'm looking down on it because of the topography so for probably the first 20 minutes or so since i could not go around and do a 360 like i wanted to i did operate uh, we outside the car because my um my aide is in the car, and he's talking to me, and he's talking to everybody outside the scene. I'm here on with the portable. I'm talking to everybody in the scene and my aide. You know what I mean? So when I need something, I call him. He gets it for me. Um, I also track resources, and he tracks resources. And one of the uh, things that I tried to do early on is I tried to identify the cars. So I, I reach out to the first in ladder officer and he tells me, you know, he's got a car outside and a lot of people injured. And I ask him, what what car is he on? And he gives me a five digit number and I wrote it down. But those five digit numbers were um, it was too much. You could not remember 84 or 621. And each car had a different number. So that was ineffective to try to identify the cars by the car number. Uh, believe it or not, we didn't have a way to mark these cars until we got one of the, um, the, the we have we actually host the FEMA team for a PA Task Force One in Philadelphia. So it wasn't until we got our the resources of a FEMA truck on scene that we had a can of spray paint that we were able to mark these cars properly. 
And that went a long way in identifying each one of them. Because when you think about it, if you can't identify a car, then we can't tell a resource like an engine company or a ladder company or a special rescue, which car to go to. And that's all part of our organization. So after this particular assignment, I carried a can of spray paint in my bag for five or six years and, I, and really never got a chance to use it again. But it was one of the re recommendations that we used in the um, after action review for the department to have all the battalion chiefs and deputy chiefs cars carry a can of spray paint. Because, you know, not only for a train crash, but it could be used for any uh, unusual uh, dwelling or building that you need to, you know, let people know what what division they're in. Mm -hmm. All right. And then oh, when when did you get like the first report that there were fatalities? So. It, it took a little while because we had so many injured so, and the fatality count kept going up, you know, at, at one point, now I'm talking about after 24 minutes, um, my boss comes up and he's division two. And I tell him, I never got a, a I never got to do a 360. And uh, I said, I want to do that now. And he said, good. He, he assumes command and I start this 360, but I have to start it out uh, around the back end. And I wind up over here. And um, the, the problem with doing that 360 is I kept encountering people and problems. And, uh, you know, it took me away from where I was supposed to be in the East Division. So one of the one of the challenges we had for everybody who responded, my boss included, was how to get to where the command post was. You know what I mean? He he responded from over here at Frankfurt and Sedgley. But this look makes it look like it's kind of short. It, it was a, a challenge to figure out how to get, you know, from one side of this incident to the other. And when I got to the, the rear of car number seven, even though people were self-evacuating through here, the catenary wires, which we weren't sure if they were live or not, were probably only six or seven feet above the ground. You know, it was it was that precarious where um, I had to put an engine company there in order to... Uh, guard that area so nobody would walk into a wire because we weren't sure if they were de-energized or not. So I was putting out little fires, so to speak, uh, as I'm walking around this incident. And then I keep finding um, other people like um, the head of OEM. You know, she wants to know where where is the command post, you know, and I, so I had to physically help this person get to a you know, specific location, you know, and it you know just all a lot of little things like that. So I get the 360 done and meet back up with my um, with the incident commander. I keep East Division. My other associate takes West Division, and that's basically how we ran it. And it was um, the first four cars, and we Chief Lane were considered uh, East Division, and then the, the rear of the train five, six, and seven were the West Division, uh, along with West Division EMS. And were there any resources, uh, I don't know, I guess I would call that the other other end of We Chief Lane? Did any, any resources come in from that side? So some of the police officers use that, and some of our companies did, but what you don't see here is the um, the tanker cars. And, oh. you know, they 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 created, even though you can go under them and around them and through them, it's not safe to do in any respects because um, we we didn't have a handle on what everybody was doing early on in the incident. It took a while. It probably took an hour and a half to two hours to get everybody taken out of this scene. And then it took a little bit longer for the transports to be completed. You know what I mean? Once we got them out of there, that was half the battle out of the initial um, accident scene. Because like I said, it's um, dark and un basically untenable and, and not the optimal place to treat a patient. So uh, this this other area, 2121, kind of didn't come into play, even though we knew a little bit about it. How do you do crew accountability on a scene like this? You know, in a structure, you got almost like a definitive A, B, C, D side, divisions one, two, three. Yeah. And Everybody knows and, what and, you're talking about when you say it. How do you how do you mark and account 
on an incident scene like this? So basically, the, you know, I use a clipboard and my aide uses a clipboard. We knew because I was in this particular assignment for approximately three years up to this point. So I had first hand knowledge and uh, and a relationship with everybody who responded. One of the things we do in Philadelphia, and they probably do it everywhere, um, is we make rounds. So I visit the local companies in this area once a week on my tour. And I go and I sit in the office and it's it's a little rudimentary, but we do uh, staffing with pen and paper. So we get to talk face to face with somebody. I know who the person is. I made jobs with every one of these people. They knew me. I knew them. We use a hydrant roll call slip, which it relies on the company officer to know, you know, where who their people are. I rely on myself to know the company officer. That's kind of our accountability. Uh, you know, you have an incident here and you lose somebody. Everybody knows that person. And it's always been one of my pet peeves uh, in the department when I would go into a station and you'd have somebody working there for the day. And I would say, uh, who's the guy at the end of the table? They said, oh, I don't know. He's a guy from Detailed In. I said, well, what's his name? You know, go find out that guy's name because that's a, what if we lose him in 30 minutes? You know what I mean? So it's really relied upon on the company officer to fill out a slip every day. And uh, that that's basically the way we do it. And we, I had a pretty good handle on everybody who was who responded on this incident because I worked with them for three years. But is is there par checks and things like that that happen on an incident like this? There are, but usually it's uh, once things calm down or um, once a, like a catastrophic event happened. So if there was obviously if there was a collapse, that would be uh, you know something that would trigger a par. Uh, if somebody was missing, if someone had a mayday. You know, they're all normal things to conduct a par. Um, we did we did have a par for this particular assignment, but it was probably uh, two hours into it because it was when the incident was winding down. And then how is radio traffic handled? I, you know, I can't only imagine the volume of radios and the volume of radio traffic that must be. So, like I said, I, I only talk to companies and i talk to my aide and we, we it actually works out pretty well when we, we use the incident command system on every assignment so this particular assignment was a four alarm and you know my aide never gives up the communication it, it's called it's the command post but it's also uh the single point communicator so anything outside this incident goes through the command post through the, the field incident technician uh, even when my boss will show up, it, when it goes from a battalion level to a division level or even a commissioner's level, he will. Oh, everybody uses the same communication. It'll be command to communication. There's only one communication and there's only one command. So inside the uh, the event, we talk freely and we use like an attack channel. But outside the organ, outside the event, it all goes through one vehicle. And that, that seems to work for us. And how many patients were transported by the fire department? You know, it was about 200 people transported, but they were transported all different ways. Um, the, the fire department transported a, a very small majority of people. And we kind of got gigged for that a little bit um, because we, we didn't have, we were, we were the, um, primary agency when when we have an incident in philadelphia you know it's either the police or the fire so if it's an active shooter obviously it's the uh police but for uh, a mass casualty event which this was it, it pretty much comes down to uh, the fire department and we got gigged for not having a casualty transportation officer um we had one but we couldn't control when the police officers put three people in a car and took them away mm. We had eight fatal injuries, 46 were serious, 113 were minor, eight people had no injury at all. So it was just under uh, 200 people. Um, one of the things we got gigged with, but that only three of the 46 people that had serious injuries 
had an ambulance transport transportation chart. Like we only like of the of the most serious people, only three of them went in a medic unit. The police were pretty much taking people, put them in the back of uh, wagons, and taking them to the hospital. And as crazy as that sounds, um, any of the patients that we've talked to later, uh, which we had some communications with, they were grateful that the police officers took them out of that scene. Uh, like I said, Rich, the um, this, the scene wasn't some place tenable and where you could treat a patient. You had to you had to get them out of there. Um, so, like I said, we got gig from the NTSB on a few things like that. Uh, not spreading out the um, patients to enough hospitals. We, you know, we're very fortunate in Philadelphia. We probably have five or six trauma hospitals within 10 miles of this. We probably have, you know, 15 other hospitals that are, uh, you know, options. But what happens when the police officer comes from, say, lower North Philadelphia and they get a patient, they go to where they know they took it back to lower North Philadelphia. And you know, like I said, we got gigged for that. It's kind of a hard thing to um, uh, manage. But I think when you talk about a mass casualty incident like this, you talk about managing a scene, you got you to gotta remember, like a casualty transportation officer isn't one person. It's got to be a team. You could probably have half a dozen people working as a group to keep that organized and keep the communications flowing back and forth, finding out what hospital uh are available what has the capacity to take a a a level one trauma you know things like that but um i don't think anybody died after they were started receiving patient care not not that i know of Mm -hmm. what are some of the other fire department lessons learned from this incident um let me see um Rather than lessons learned, um, some of the challenges that we had were just shutting down rail traffic, shutting, making sure that the electric was shut down. They That consumed probably the first 30 minutes. Um, when I was standing on the top of the tracks, and this is the only f- real photo I have, this is taken an hour and a half into the incident, and it's on a roof uh, adjacent to the tracks. This is car number one. And the reason I put this up is ha- how dim the light is. We never were able to get um, a good visual of this entire scene. You know, it really wasn't until daybreak the next morning. And uh, while I'm standing on this track and I'm looking to the left, I know it's an S curve. And I know those trains are coming from Trenton, New Jersey. And I know that the track speed's pretty high. But not only was I worried about a, a a passenger train coming through here. I was worried about a freight train coming through here. Because even if you lost all of the electrical catenary power, a freight car is diesel powered and they're under their own control. The only thing that would have stopped them would have been a, a signal that, you know, a slow signal or no signal at all. And one of the things we found out later in the investigation was that um, Amtrak controls everything from Wilmington, Delaware, and it's their national operations center. But there's there's CNOC and there's CTEC. CTEC is the area that controls train movement in this area. And they basically have a board that looks like a model railroad set. And when this train came off the tracks and it killed all of the electric in this area, that screen went from green to red. It lit up like a Christmas tree. Everybody who had anything to do with this knew that this was a major event. Every emergency management person from Amtrak gets a a, a page or a, a notification when this train goes into emergency. They knew, you know, any if, if you were an emergency manager in Chicago, you knew that at 920, Amtrak 188 was in emergency at Frankfurt Junction because it, that's the way their technology worked. Rich, what was your, your question was going to focus on the well, lessons, lessons learned? Lessons learned, uh, you know, would you guys do anything different if you had it happen again? Uh, you know, I, I you know, we, we did as much as we could planning-wise, like from a personal perspective. But when I looked at this area and I looked at um, look where I made the staging area, and it was about two blocks away, and that's kind of something I would do routinely for a fire. 
when I think about how much real estate we took for this particular assignment, I would have taken probably almost three quarters of a mile or a mile. We had to, you have to look at this neighborhood a little bit different because of all the way the, the streets feed each other. But we really should have taken a lot more real estate for like the staging area and the exclusion zone because we needed a lot of area to operate. Um, that was that's one big takeaway. The other takeaway is just uh, some of the, the tools and equipment, the spray paint to mark the cars. Uh, at the time, most of the firemen were using handheld lights that were attached to their uh, their bunker coats, and that worked fine. But we needed more, and it wasn't until we really got the uh, the, the office of emergency management on scene, some of the special ops companies, some of the special ops from the police department who all had battery operated lighting because we were three, four, 500 feet away from any apparatus. And up to this point, our standard operating procedure would be to run a, uh, a an extension cord, a junction box and a light from an apparatus. But once you exceed 300 feet, you know, it's too far. Um, so now all ladder companies, special operations companies, they all have uh, portable battery lighting that uh, they, they can bring in. And that's huge. Um, yeah. Some of the other things, lessons learned with tools and equipment. We had ladder companies bring in hearse tools, the jaws of life and everything else uh, from great distances. And it took a lot of uh, time and personnel to do that. Uh, where in reality, we only we, we only needed, say, saws all or cutters. And some of the special ops companies uh, all had hydraulic tools, which were battery operated cutters and spreaders. And they, you know, that's all we needed. Most of the people who were stuck in, in these cars were stuck by either the uh, overhead luggage, which was tubular steel or the seats. And once you were able to dislodge them, they, they were pretty much they were good. Uh, of the eight people that were killed, most of them were killed because they were ejected by the, uh, from the train. And I think it was car number three. We lost four people from that car. And during the NTSB's investigation, they looked at the windows on the particular train car. All nine windows uh, were dislodged, became separated from the train. And that's how people got thrown from the train. Mm. Let me ask you a hypothetical question, uh, because it's becoming more and more prevalent or accessible for the fire service. How much value do you think there would have been for you as an incident commander if you had a drone overhead? So it would have been very helpful. And, and, the, and the reason I say that is because one of the assets that we used was a police helicopter. Uh, and the police helicopter had a very large light on it. And when they used it, when that light was used in, in, in the right area, it, it made the scene look like daylight. But it took a little bit to get that helicopter where we needed it. And it, there was a, some challenges with the communications between the ground and the helicopter. But the uh, when you look at some of the video from the helicopter after the fact, you know, it was it was very valuable. And a drone would have been very valuable. Um, and I know we're look, our department's looking into that. I mean, it, it, you know, in a couple of years, we probably will have a drone. Yeah. Rich, you, you mentioned something out about lessons learned. And uh, another low-tech item that uh, we probably didn't fully utilize was command vest. You know, when we go to an incident and it's uh, myself and the battalion chief that I run with regularly, we don't need a vest because we know who we are. But when we operate in a unified command system with, say, the police, OEM, uh, the rail agencies, and and anybody else, those vests are important to identify key players in, in the organization. And it's something that I think it came out of the after action review. Uh, we didn't utilize it, but I think uh, going forward, we could. We talked about the battery powered portable lighting. Another low tech item that we didn't use is every battalion chief's car has a bullhorn. And when you think about directing people who are dazed and confused coming from a train crash, that bullhorn would have been uh, a good thing to utilize to direct people. I mentioned earlier about the uh, the three inch water line. 
I mean, that was huge running that water line, you know, in case we had a fire, but it created a safe egress uh, path for anybody who could, who was dazed, confused, or just couldn't see that well. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, another thing that popped up was tourniquets. You know, every fire company in the city is a first responder, and we have a first responder's bag, and we have a tourniquet. When you compare the fire department to the police department, the police department, every officer has a tourniquet, and they have it on their body. And they have, you know, not only for themselves, but it could be for someone else. So another low-tech item would be to carry tourniquets. You know, as crazy as that sounds, it, it may have sounded crazy 20 years ago, but I think, you know, in the environment we work in today, I don't think it's crazy for a fireman to carry a tourniquet. And it's uh, just a... Something else that came out of the after action review. Are they doing that now? Do you know? I, I, I'm not sure. I know I, I always carried one at the end, but, uh, and probably say it can, comes down to a cost factor. I don't, a tourniquet's probably 25 or $30. It's, it's well worth it, you know, to keep in your coat pocket. You know, you have a $30 pair of cutters in your pocket. Why not have a $30 tourniquet? Great. Yeah. But uh, you take, you take a $30 tourniquet times, 3,000 firefighters, and there is a cost. <laughs> so every fireman carries a 30-foot um, a piece of webbing to make an improvised harness. What do you think they use for the tourniquets? They use what they have. You know what I mean? So, you know, yeah. that's what firemen are going to do, though. Um, yeah. So one of the things – go ahead. Good. I was going to say, one of the things that didn't really come up because of the way this presentation went uh, – a lot of these cars were on their side. And when a train car, it's a stainless steel train car on its side, and you have to access through the emergency window, it's about 11 feet off the ground. Now, firemen are very resourceful, but it's pretty hard for them to try and uh, climb up the side of that car. The ladder companies that brought ladders to this uh, accident actually helped us out greatly. We had to use ladders for almost every car in order to access uh the train cars and it, this is a ladder is probably not something that we'd really want to think is the first thing that we would bring especially in a electrified area because you know we, we could almost you don't like to say never too often but you could almost say i would never put anybody on the roof of an electric train car because it's full of electric and then you get closer to the catenary and the catenary you know it, it'll kill you if you touch it so the initiative of ladder companies to bring ladders to the scene was was definitely a great help. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was smart on someone's part. Yeah, uh, so um, go ahead. Did they have to extricate anybody vertically out of the out of those cars that were on their sides? You mean were anybody trapped under the cars? No, no, no. If you're if you're in the car and the car is on its side. I would presume the only way out is up through the pop windows if it's on its side. Yeah. To go vertical so out. So they, they did. It wasn't really extricating, but the, the people who were most severely injured were the people who were thrown from the cars. And there were quite a few people outside the cars, and there were some people under the cars. Um, almost, I know they, they did take some people out through the windows but I don't know the extent of the injuries for any of them. The majority of the people who had very severe injuries were probably thrown from the car. And then uh, how long did it take after the incident for NTSB to arrive? They actually, before we left the scene, um, so this came in around 9.20. I got there at 9.30. I stayed till 6 o'clock the next morning. Um the NTSB was there in the middle of the night. I'm going to say, I'm not sure the exact time, probably like two, three o'clock in the morning. They were there, I would say, within six or seven hours of this incident. And uh, and it just ramped up from there. Um, we were able to, the only people we kept on scene were a few of the uh, chief officers. Myself stayed. My associate stayed, my boss, um, the special ops, the commissioners, but every fireman that responded, we were able to, to get relief 
by, say, 2 o'clock in the morning and send them back to the firehouses. And we brought other companies in. And then uh, our operational period ended at 8 a.m. I turned it over to uh, my relief, which was Battalion 10 on a different platoon. And uh, they kept a presence there for about five days. This happened on a, a Tuesday night. By Friday, they pretty much had it wrapped up. They recovered the last body on Thursday at lunchtime. Uh, by Friday, the railroad had that rail almost ready to run. It was, it was that close. They kept it shut down over the weekend, and there was a memorial service on Sunday night uh, at the scene. And then they resumed uh, train service on Monday morning. What day of the week did it occur? It happened on a Tuesday night. A Tuesday, okay, yeah, yeah. Um, if it happened, if it happened on a Wednesday night, which was my next night to work, I would not have been there. My daughter was graduating college uh, that Friday, and I knew for two years that uh, on uh, Wednesday morning I would be traveling to Washington D.C. and I did. Hopefully so it was just a matter of luck. Hopefully not on a train. No, not on a train, but I, I could have. Yeah. yeah. So what were some of the NTSB findings about contributing factors and things related to train operations, speed of the train? What, what so all came from that? We, we, we talked about it briefly, um, but this, this all starts with um, several trains being stoned in lower North Philadelphia, which is about four or five miles down the tracks, uh, right outside 30th Street Station. An Amtrak train going from Trenton to Philadelphia gets stoned, breaks the, the windshield, but he continues on and he whoa, makes it to 30th Street. Whoa, 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 whoa. What's, what's stoned mean? Um, kids playing on the tracks threw a rock at the train. Oh, okay. All right. Well, that's. I'm that's sorry. Easy. I'm sorry. I'm a, I'm a country boy. I don't know what, what city kids do to their trains. So it happens once in a while. Uh, and this particular night, it happened. So an, an inbound Amtracker gets um, a rock thrown at it. It, bre it breaks the windshield. It continues on. Around the same time, a SEPTA train on track number one is coming out of 30th Street on its way to Trenton, and he gets a, a rock thrown at it. But it must have been you know, better placed, and he gets glass in his face. So he gets glass in his eyes. He stops his train. And he calls for a medic unit and for assistance, uh, you know, on track number one at like I, I'm just 25th and Diamond. That created another fire department response. So there was actually two train incidents going on at the same time. And there was a lot of confusion about if they were separate or the same or whatever. So Amtrak 188 now is leaving 30th Street Station. And he knows that, and that the SEPTA train is stopped on track number one, and he's going to overtake this train on track number two. So he communicates with them. And uh, he says, oh, you know, hope you have nobody on the ground. I'm going to be passing you on track number two. He goes to pass him. He blows his horn. He gets by them safely. But there's a lot of communication between the dispatcher and the SEPTA train that's disabled because the operator has glass in his eye. So this goes on for, I don't know, five or 10 minutes. And the whole time, Amtrak 188 is proceeding up the Northeast Corridor en route to Trenton, New Jersey. So the NTSB thinks that the engineer of 188 lost his situational awareness, likely due to his atten attention being diverted to the SEPTA train emergency. So it was just one of the things that contributed. He lost his bearing of where he was. He was, you know, part of his attention was diverted towards um, the SEPTA train. And he, he thought he was further up because of the darkness and because of, the, you know, it's hard to judge the physical characteristics. And uh, when someone is a, a train operator, those physical characteristics are all by memory. You know, one of the qualifications is he has to go and ride that area and then present in front of a, a you know, a, a train examiner to get qualified on that section of railroad along with a, quite a few other things. But, uh, you know, we've all done it and, uh, you know, you're riding in front of a train and you're memorizing the track, so to speak. 
you know, he has a little bit uh, better of an advantage because you could also use your, you know, your uh, book of rules or your timetable as reference while you're running a train. It's not like you're reading a book, but if you if you need to be refreshed on something, book could be open. But they also found out that there was no other. He he was not impaired, not on drugs, didn't have his phone on, uh, didn't have any other external uh, distraction. It came down to that radio transmission and uh, losing bearing of where he was. The interesting what they recommend is the solution to that. So what another co a contributing factor that they put was um, positive train control which is uh, a, a system where if you pass a signal and don't act, you know, reduce the speed of the train, the train will go into emergency. The train will slow down and stop. So they were retrofitting the railroad with this positive train control. If this train was coming from Trenton, New Jersey to 30th Street, positive train control was in effect for tracks three and four. They have not gotten around to put it on track one or two coming from 30th Street to Trenton because their risk assessment was that the track speed was slower coming into that curve as compared to the other way. By Monday morning, when uh, they were going to resume train uh, service, positive train control was on all tracks. <laughs> So that, and that's right out of the NTSB report. Uh, they also, the NTSB is also looking into uh, why so many of the windows failed. Um, that's, you know, some of the things that they look at after the fact. Uh, you know, they look at putting a second person in the uh, the cab as, a, you know, second engineer. Not only having forward-facing cameras, but having uh, you know rear-facing cameras where you're actually watching the engineer. I know the uh, the engineers' union probably isn't you know real happy with some stuff like that, but you know we had eight people killed, two hundred injured. You know, it, it shut down rail service for five days and uh, created hardship for a lot of people. Yeah. Hmm. Is there anything you'd want to share that? you hadn't shared because I didn't ask you the right question. You can stop the screen share too. No, just, we, we reiterated the, uh, the key takeaways, which is shutting down the rail traffic, ensuring that the electric was shut down breaking the scene into manageable uh, areas, you know, trying to break each car down uh, to a, a, a division, uh, having the proper tools and equipment, bringing spray paint, ladders, uh, stretching that water line as a way of egress. You know, that was huge. And a, a lot of the things that happened was because of the initiative of the people making those decisions. It wasn't me telling the, the pump operator to make a U-turn and stretch out water line. That's what they did. You didn't have to tell a ladder company to bring a ladder. That's what they did. Um, but really, when you look at the success of this particular incident, it wasn't just the fire department. It was a collaborative effort of police, the fire department, EMS, Office of Emergency Management, you know, I only talked briefly about OEM, but they're the umbrella group of all city services for most municipalities. And uh, having them and the resources were almost unlimited. So when we brought in light wagons later in the night, they came from the airport, they came from the police department, they came from the water department. They came from every part of city government that you can think of. And now the fire department has their own. But that's the umbrella that you really need. And I, I talked about one operational period. I went home at 8 o'clock in the morning, the next morning. Uh, OEM was there for weeks uh, trying to reunite families, uh, having a family relocation centers, the accountability. I didn't really talk about during my size up, I came across one of the conductors. And uh, I asked him how many people were on the train. He said uh, 243 and five employees. Well, that continued to go up, you know, over the, the you know the days, uh, you know, after that. But a lot of that was handled by the Office of Emergency Management. 
You know what I mean? The fire department does real well for one operational period, but we don't have the resources to keep it going. And we don't, you know, and that's what they do. The Office of Emergency Management does day in and day out. And that's such a valuable resource uh, for everybody. You know what I mean? It makes the every visitor that comes to the city safer. It makes everybody better off. Um, that's the only plug I'm going to give. Oh, yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you for spending some time with me today to talk about the train derailment, the role you played, and some of the uh, findings and ideas and lessons learned. Uh, I think it was very valuable for our, our listeners and viewers because there's basically train tracks through towns of all sizes um, from the smallest communities. You know, that, that Amtrak train goes through a lot of small communities, just the same as it does bigger communities. Absolutely. And, and, and the potential for this to happen in anyone's town is, uh, is significant. Um, if they have any kind of, uh, rail traffic whatsoever, be it be it freight or or passenger, and certainly much greater um, risk to human uh, injuries and fatalities if it's a passenger train. But the 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 freight also presents a lot of oh, absolutely, absolutely. Fine. Yeah. Um, all right. So thank you, Vince, and uh, thanks everybody for sharing your time with us today. All right. Thanks, Rich. <sighs> Thank you to Vince Mulray, retired Philadelphia Deputy Fire Chief, for sharing your story about that horrific train derailment. If you've been following along for a while with me on social media, you know that I had taken six months sabbatical from teaching live events on the road at the uh, in the middle of 2013. <clears throat> for 14 years leading up to the pandemic, I had consistently delivered between 90 and 120 programs a year. Taking some time off helped me to recharge my batteries and helped to remind me of just how passionate I am about the topic of situational awareness. That time off also provided an opportunity for our, our master instructors uh, who are trained to teach this program to step up and deliver some programs themselves. If you're interested in joining me for an upcoming program, here are some of the places that we are going to be. On January 22 through February 2, we will be at the Sun, I'm sorry, the Syncrude Refinery in Fort McMurray, Alberta. <clears throat> at the conclusion of this event, I will have delivered 71 programs for Syncrude as part of their Periods of High Vulnerability program, where we help process operators with the skills to have better situational awareness and to improve their high-risk decision-making. On February 5 through 9, we'll be at the Suncor Edmonton Refinery in Edmonton, Alberta. Suncor is the parent company to Syncrude. And since Syncrude has experienced, as they describe it, a fundamental change in their organizational culture as a result of our training, the program is now being rolled out to all their other refineries as well. And this will be our third visit to Suncor Edmonton. On February 10, we'll be delivering a program for the Canada Task Force 2 group in Calgary, Alberta. This will be the first time that I have presented to the task force group in Canada. So I'm really looking forward to that. On February 29th, I'll be in Florida for the Center for Public Safety Excellence Conference in Orlando. This will be the eighth time I've presented for the CPSE Excellence Conference. So thank you for your faith and confidence in my message and the opportunity to be with your attendees again in 2024. <clears throat> March 1 and 2, I will be at the Spotsylvania Volunteer Fire Department in Spotsylvania, Virginia. This is the second program I have delivered for the Spotsylvania Volunteer Fire Department. On March 4 and 5, I will be at the University of Maryland's National Fire Service Staff and Command Program in Annapolis, Maryland. This will be my 22nd year presenting at the National Fire Service Staff and Command Program. So thank you for your faith and confidence in me with 
you, the attendees of your program. I really appreciate that support. April, April 19 and 20, I'll be at the Taos County Fire Department in Red River, New Mexico. I'm especially excited about this program as New Mexico is the only U.S. state where I've not presented a program until April, and that will change. And our master instructors have been working hard adding their programs as well. Collectively, they delivered more than 30 programs from September through December 2023. You can always see the list of all of our upcoming programs and more information about our master instructors on the samatters.com website. Oh, I also want to thank the hosts of some recent programs and consultations that we've been able to uh, complete in the uh, final quarter of 2023. <clears throat> On September 27th, I conducted a training for failure program for the Swissvale Fire Department, a suburb of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. This was the sixth program I've been given the opportunity to deliver for the Swissvale Fire Department and for fire departments in their region. On September 28th, I facilitated a discussion with accident investigators from the National Institute of Occupational Safety and Health, NIOSH, in Morgantown, West Virginia. These are the investigators that evaluate firefighter line of duty death incidents, and they're interested in adding more content to those reports on situational awareness, human factors, and human error, and I'm helping them to accomplish that mission. On September 29 and 30, I conducted two programs for the Wisconsin Rapids Fire Department in Wisconsin Rapids, Wisconsin. One on situational awareness and one on preparing for your climb down the ladder of success for when your career ends by retirement, injury, or otherwise. On October 4, I gave a presentation at the Colorado Traffic Incident Management Conference in Denver, Colorado. This was my second time delivering a program for the Colorado Traffic Incident Management Conference. So thank you for that faith and, and confidence and the opportunity to be with your conference attendees again. I really appreciated that. It was a great day of learning. On November 9 through 12, I was at the International Association of Fire Chiefs Volunteer and Combination Officer Section Symposium in the Sun in Clearwater Beach, Florida. I wasn't there to present. I was there to award two scholarships sponsored by my company. The scholarships are designed to recognize emerging leaders. This year's winners were Assistant Chief Jeff Drager from Maple Bluff, Wisconsin, and Battalion Chief Matt Alto from Estacada Rural Fire District in Oregon. So congratulations to both of you, and I, and I really enjoyed spending some time with you at the conference in Florida. On November 27 through December 1, uh, we're at Suncor Edmonton Refinery again in Edmonton, Alberta, training process operators on situational awareness and high-risk decision-making. And then on December 9th, I delivered a program for the Maryland Fire Chiefs Association in Ocean City, Maryland. And this was the fourth program that I've had the opportunity to deliver for the Maryland Fire Chiefs Association. And what a fantastic turnout. What a great group of people that we had for the Chiefs event in Maryland. It was really, really enjoyable. If you're interested in hosting a live event or a virtual program, just click on the Contact Us tab at the top of the SA Matters homepage, and I'll give you a call. Finally, remember to check the show notes for how to subscribe to our newsletter, how to follow us on social media. There we share ideas about how to improve situational awareness, how to make better decisions under stress, and how to improve the skills of critical thinking and resilient problem solving. Well, that's it. Episode 399 of the Situational Awareness Matters show is complete. Thank you again to my guest, Vince Mulray, retired Philadelphia Deputy Fire Chief. And thank you to our viewers and listeners for sharing some of your valuable time with me today. I really appreciate your support of the SA Matters mission. Be safe out there and may the peace of the Lord and strong situational awareness be with you always. 
You've been listening to the Situational Awareness Matters Show with Dr. Richard Gassaway. If you're interested in learning more about situational awareness, human factors, and decision-making under stress, visit his website, essaymatters.com. If you're interested in booking Dr. Gassaway for a program, or if you would like to be a guest on his show, click the Contact Us tab at the top of the homepage.